You only need a multi-speed tape recorder and a few complementary tools to provide for unassailable objectivity. Uh, mind you, I'm not going to pretend that that's a particularly lofty undertaking, measuring the attack and decay of Alexis Weisenberg's scales or, or, or mine or somebody else's, but it's at least a more, well, commendable enterprise, eh, than, than coining clichés like uh, fleet fingers or purling runs or whatever, you know. But, Glenn, how can any critic come back to the office after a concert, plug himself or herself into the kind of electronic gadgetry that you're talking about and still meet the proverbial 2 a.m. <sighs> deadline? Well, that'd be quite a feat, I suppose. But, of course, my comments were based on the assumption that he shouldn't be there in the first place, that the critic should get out of the performance arena, uh, as indeed should everybody else, and produce, if he has to produce something, a more, um, more reflective style of journalism, you know. I kind of think that's wishful thinking on your part. Well, maybe so, Karen, but I do want to emphasize one other thing, though, that none of these bits of... of uh, Poll taking should ever be confused in any degree, whatever, with value judgments. But you've functioned as a critic yourself many times, Glenn. I mean, mm -hmm. I know that you've written guest pieces for the New York Times, for Saturday Review, the New Republic, and, uh, yeah, and that's, other publications. That's true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, are you suggesting then that only professionals are qualified to be critics? Oh no, no, absolutely not. As, as a matter of fact, the kind of data I was talking about could be gathered obviously just as handily by a layman and as a matter of fact in a conversational context Karen I am much more inclined to trust a layman's intuition than a professional's book learning on just about any subject but what I am saying is that if either layman or professional is going to spring into print or going to assault the airwaves with a considered opinion on something or other there really ought to be some uh, well givens you know some absolute yardsticks involved in the in the decision making process in fact without those givens uh, i think as i said before that the whole the whole matter of criticism ought to be subjected to a much much more intense legal scrutiny but uh, since you brought up the question of my own critical scribblings um let me say in their defense that i have only two criteria as an occasional critic um neither of which would commend themselves to most reviewers, I'm sure. The first is, do I like this, whatever it is, do I like this enough to want to celebrate it in print? Or in the alternative, the, the second criteria, am I sufficiently outraged uh, morally, not aesthetically, mind you, morally, uh, to feel compelled to issue a warning to the world accordingly? Mm -hmm. But, Glenn, that's exactly the reverse of what people say the critic is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. He's not supposed to be involved with moral judgments at all. As a, as a matter of fact, those are the criteria of a, of a missionary, not a critic. Well, uh, so be it, as they say in missionary circles. I think the critic should be a missionary, as a matter of fact. As far as I'm concerned, if I, as, a, as an occasional critic, have anything at all to say, it has to be said within the context of an almost uh, propagandistic advocacy. In fact, I guess that's really what I am at heart, Karen. I'm, I'm not a critic at all. I'm a propagandist, you know. But isn't there at least a contradiction between your preoccupation with moral judgments and all of this talk about scientific data? Yeah, yeah, I think, yes, I wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, however, whatever moral issues are involved are, are certainly my first priority. And when a conflict arises between the the two concepts, it's inevitably resolved in, in their favor, in favor of the moral judgment. As a matter of fact, Karen, I only brought up the question of, of proof systems, so to speak, of, of hard evidence as a sort of diversionary tactic. It, it could be done, mind you. They could be implemented, especially with regard to recordings, obviously. And if we must have critics, then at least it's a means of, of uh, making them keep their value judgments to themselves, you know. But surely you make value judgments. I mean, you, you even make them when you adopt your role as advocate. Yeah, that's true in a way. But you have to remember that I begin from a vantage point of unbridled enthusiasm. And since I'm a determined propagandist, uh, since that's my role, as we've now decided, I try to qualify that enthusiasm as little as possible. Actually, what I, what I practice is what I like to think of anyway as a kind of, um, well, creative dishonesty, you know? I'm much more interested in whatever beneficial effect my my comments can have on the subject to which they're addressed than on such, to me, relatively irrelevant concepts as accuracy or editorial responsibility or whatever. Oh, in, in other words, to put it bluntly, you tell lies. <laughs> yeah, yes, I do. Sure I do. If I, if I have no moral objection to what somebody's trying to do, and if I tell them that what they're doing is great, whether in fact I happen to think it is or not, uh, the chances are that under that blanket of enthusiasm, you know, which I really think is the most important gift that one person can give to another, they'll do it better anyway than they would have done before, which is, after all, to the benefit of, of all concerned. So in one stroke, you see, I have fulfilled a moral responsibility and executed in the best sense of the word a 
A um, sublimely selfish act. Oh, that's that's unanswerable. <laughs> You're speechless. I'm speechless. <laughs> the, the main thing is just don't believe a word I say. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for talking to me today. It was great fun. From our CBC Toronto studios, I've been talking to Glenn Gould.